record. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, uh, well, I was going to say uh, I'm coming to you this morning from the COVID capital of the world, but I believe that uh, Florida has now lost that dubious title. Uh, anyway, I'm Roger, and I will be uh, your discussion leader for the next couple hours. I see we have a fine group here. Uh, we've got a lot of names in alphabetical order. Some folks are still joining, but uh, there are 20 of us. So what we need to adopt at the beginning here is uh, how we're going to communicate most effectively. And uh, that generally is by means of the Q&A box. So uh, there is information from uh, the PDH source in the chat, if you may notice on your screen. Uh, but if you want to communicate regarding the course, please click on the Q&A, type in a question, and I'm going to be watching it. Usually the, the Q&A thing flashes on my screen. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the worst question you can ask is the one you don't ask. If you think it's something you want to ask, then for goodness sakes, ask it. You're paying good money for this course. You deserve to get as much out of it as possible. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, this is kind of a summary course. Uh, you will not leave this course knowing how to design a 100 megawatt hour storage facility. But you'll have a pretty good idea of what's out there and what's coming. And uh, so with that, <clears throat> let, let's get started. Um, Credit for this, by the way, way back in 2012, I don't know if anybody can remember back that far. It's hard for me to remember nine years ago, but certainly a lot of changes have happened. But way back then, the National Renewable Energy Lab commissioned this study. And all the folks who were involved here from all over the place, the, the challenge was, is it going to be possible to be at a level of 80% renewable energy by the year 2050? That was the question they were trying to answer. And if in fact, that's what's how we're gonna do it, how are we gonna to have to do what, what? Let's draw a roadmap for that situation. Now, uh, uh, by the end of this uh, conversation this morning, some of you may wanna join me. I, I, I decided I wanna be watching that roadmap and be a part of it. And in fact, uh, the company I work for is uh, actually owned by a former student. Uh, and uh, we're in the engineering business of designing photovoltaic systems, mostly residential. Uh, 12 megawatts of, of residential over the last nine months. And we're working on some larger projects now as well. But it's a relatively new company formed less than a year ago. So uh, uh, there is a lot going on and storage is a big part of it at large levels and at small levels. And it could well be that small storage will uh, be a very important part. So part of the question then when you deal with energy storage is how much are we gonna need? Uh, and traditionally people have been asking the question, uh, how much generation cap capacity are we gonna need? And of course that question will remain, but um, most people have probably noticed that the sun after it sets, it doesn't produce a whole lot of energy. So there needs to be some uh, replacements for the sun after dark. Now, the wind still blows oftentimes, but that's somewhat unpredictable as, as well. Not quite as predictable as the sun, which pretty much rises every morning and sets every afternoon. Uh, but uh, the, these renewable sources are mighty clean, but they do create some challenges in terms of storage. So. Uh, that's where we are today. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, I see three things in the chat box. I'm going to check and see what that is. Okay, we've got good morning from David and from Ivan and from Karen. And uh, good morning to you as well. And uh, I guess what the, 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 if we distinguish between the chat box and the, uh, the Q&A, if uh, you have any issues 
with uh, reception of, of, of audio or video issues with the program. Uh, I know that Hishan is going to be watching the chat box or anything like that. So for technical issues uh, with the program itself, um, type those into the chat box. And for questions, uh, type those into the Q&A and I'll be watching that closely. And that's questions, comments, whatever, and you'll type those so that everybody can see them. Okay, so um, we, we need to give a lot of credit to these folks because they're the ones who got this thing started back in 2012. We're now able to do a progress report nine years later as to how we're doing on that. Okay, so uh, that's what we're gonna be looking at. Um, and what I wanna do is start out with small photovoltaic systems because what we can get from this is an idea of what storage can do and how it fits into the big picture. <clears throat> um, the very first solar systems were standalone, you know, the cabin in the woods, whatever, the, uh, uh, the sign on the street that uh, tells you what's going on in the highway construction where they would have needed to run a, a power line for about uh, 20 miles to, to power that sign, or if they would have had to have a gasoline generator powering the thing up where they have to keep filling up the gas tank. So uh, standalone, everybody has this memory of old cabins that have a little bit of solar, a couple hundred watts, maybe they have some lights at, on at night. Um, so these original systems, all they did was serve DC loads, but then inverters came along and then the really good inverters came along that <clears throat> could mimic the the quality of grid electricity. And uh, so they came along and IEEE 1547 started out as a different IEEE standard. Uh, but back in 2003, they had 1547, they had UL 1741, which is the testing procedure for verification of 1547, 2003. That's back in 2003. <clears throat> but in IEEE 1547 is now changing to adapt to the grid needs as the amount of solar and renewable energies uh, continues to grow at extremely fast rates, uh, exponential in terms of solar, uh, fast linearly in terms of wind, for that matter, if you want the math behind it. Um, so IEEE is changing to adapt to grid needs. Once upon a time, uh, <clears throat> the utilities were only concerned with getting rid of the PV in case they had a problem. They didn't want the, the solar uh, energizing the grid when they had to get out and do some repairs. So uh, if the grid went down, uh, the, all the solar and all renewables had to go down along with it. Now, if the grid is getting strained, the utilities are now going to be depending on keeping the solar and the wind online in order to prevent them from overloading their generation capacity. And of course, a lot of the utility generation capacity now is becoming solar. Uh, Florida Power and Light is, is one of the bigger ones having uh, a lot of solar here in Florida, but not only Florida, but all over the country. So the utilities have noticed that solar is cost effective. In fact, they're making their electricity for something less than three cents a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> depending on the location and the type of equipment that they're installing. So uh, obviously, if, if you can make electricity that cheaply, you're going to want to make it when you can and deal with the times that you can't make it another way. And one of those things, even the utilities are getting uh, into, and in fact, have been into since the days of nuclear, is large-scale storage. So it's the inverter that it's all about. And we're gonna look at some, some basic uh, systems here, but a battery backup grid connected inverter has to serve a lot of functions. Uh, and this is an important thing to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, inverters, when they're connected to the grid, they act as current sources. And the reason for that is when you connect a new source of electricity into the grid and you flip that switch, that source has to be exactly in, 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 in uh, in phase with the grid power, because if not, uh, the 
either the solar system or the small generator, if it's a rotating generator, uh, uh, somebody's generator gets hurt because that's an incredible torque trying to bring that uh, source back into sync with the grid. But if you have a current source, <clears throat> it merely monitors the phase of the voltage on the grid and injects current in phase with the voltage on the grid. Unless, of course, the utility says, we wish you could give us some current at a leading power factor so that you can help us correct our power factor, then maybe we can uh, eliminate the need for some capacitors for power factor correction. And so the utility now can actually ask your inverter without your intervention to please provide some current with a leading power factor. So current sources is the clue when the inverters are in fact connected to the grid. That's what they act as, as opposed to voltage sources. And uh, you know, the, for mechanical engineers, other disciplines, we all have the, the, the similar uh, pressure versus velocity type. Uh, what is the actual source or, or force versus velocity? Um, if the grid goes down, then if these battery backup inverters are going to continue to serve the backup loads or the uninterruptible loads, then they have to act as voltage sources so the, the loads will think that the utility is still supplying them. You need to have that 60 hertz electricity. Uh, a lot of uh, loads are dependent on the frequency to be very precise. Um, these battery backup converters will charge batteries when the grid is up and the sun is down. So if for, for some reason you've used some electricity during the day, the battery backup uh, inverter will charge up the batteries, uh, whatever is needed uh, later on after the sun goes down. The input to these inverters is the voltage of a battery, which is relatively stable. So they need, don't need to do maximum power point tracking, which relates to the uh, current versus voltage curve on the solar system. Uh, they don't need to maximize the amount of power they collect from the solar system. Other pieces of equipment do that. Um, they don't do, do ground fault detection interruption or arc fault uh, circuit interruption. At least they don't have to because that's done by other pieces of equipment. You're generally a charge controller. And they also need to be a part of a rapid shutdown system since, uh, when was it, 2014? I guess rapid shutdown came in and it was one of the first times that the requirement of NEC was not a, a prescriptive, but it was a performance type. Uh, you shut it down and we don't care how you do it if there's an emergency. So the inverter has to be one of the players in that. Uh, of course, they're very quiet. They don't make nearly the noise that a, a fossil fuel generator makes. They save on trips to the gas station because the sun comes up every morning pretty much, at least after a hurricane, it generally becomes pretty nice and you wonder what happened when you wake up to all the trees down in the street. And uh, they're compliant with UL 1741. That means that they have to do things that keep the grid happy. And uh, so then let's take a look at how do you do it? There are DC coupled systems and there are AC couple systems, okay? Now, when I flick like this quickly, uh, don't give up because first of all, this is being recorded, but secondly, you can order for no additional charge copies of these slides. And if I flick through something quickly, it's generally because I've got a picture coming up that we will explain how the picture operates on the basis of maybe some of the language before or after the picture. So the reason I'm flicking through these relatively quickly is we've got a couple of uh, illustrations that will talk about DC and AC coupled system, which are uh, in existence uh, very much so today in a form different from 15 years ago, only that they've incorporated a lot of the functions into single boxes. So here we have a DC coupled system. Let's see how this looks. Start with the PV array up in the upper left-hand corner. And every once in a while, I'm gonna just pause and look at the Q and A. 
Uh, okay, I don't. Uh, okay, uh, so we have a, a solar array that makes DC electricity. Okay, and the solar array is consist consists of strings or source circuits, and these source circuits may have oh say three thousand watts in a source circuit, ten modules. Uh, or if it's a really big system, uh, a utility scale, you might have as much as 10,000 watts in a single circuit. But typically, we're looking at something like um, somewhere between 150 and 600 volts and about 10 amps for each series string of modules. So in, in, in a way very similar to a way a distribution panel works where the utility comes in with fat wires and the loads are connected with thin wires. In this case, the solar comes in with skinny wires and leaves the source circuit combiner box on fatter wires. And they go to a charge controller, which is a smart piece of equipment that is in charge of uh, controlling the charge to the batteries. And once the batteries are full, it, it shuts down the PV array so the batteries don't get overcharged unless there is a battery backup inverter in the system. And in that case, once the storage batteries are fully charged, any excess electricity goes into the battery backup inverter. And in fact, this is the way most of these systems operate pretty much all the time, except when there's a utility outage. So once the batteries are charged, and you can see the bidirectional uh, character of the arrows there, that's the power flows. And so power only flows from the PV array to the source circuit combiner box. It only flows into the charge controller. It only comes out of the charge controller, but the batteries, energy can go in or out either way. And the same is true with the battery backup inverter. It can either accept excess DC from the array, or it can provide DC to charge the batteries if necessary. So that's why we have the bi-directional arrow there. Once you get to the battery backup inverter, um, the battery backup inverter has two AC connections on it. it actually has three, it generally also has an opportunity to connect a, a fossil fuel generator to uh, provide electricity if you really need it. Uh, an emergency backup system that works when the sun is down, even if the batteries run dry, as long as your gas tank doesn't go empty. And, and, and so during normal operation, utilities operating and the solar electricity in DC form goes into the battery backup inverter, which converts it to AC and it provides that AC, the first uh, choice for that AC is to go to the standby loads this is often called the uninterruptible panner, uh, panel. And uh, the switching takes place if the utility goes down within a few milliseconds, the standby loads are powered up by solar. In fact, generally, if it's a lighting load, for example, you don't even see a blink. Uh, if it's a computer, your screen doesn't even blink. And, and even more interesting is your electric clocks don't lose their uh, you don't have to reset your electric clock. So this happens really fast if the utility goes down. And uh, once the standby loads are satisfied, if you've got some leftover solar, uh, that goes up to the distribution panel, which is where you're connecting to the utility, uh, one way of doing it anyway, where it satisfies the needs of loads up there to the extent possible. And the utility then, as you can see, there's a bidirectional arrow there, which says if your solar is making more electricity than you need in the facility, the rest is sold back to the utility. And when the solar isn't making enough, the utility is there to back it up. Okay, and this has been a complaint by the utility all along up until now, where they've felt like even if you have solar, they still have to be there and they can't cut back on their uh, generation capacity. And, and so they, they felt at a disadvantage. Well, that, that's, we're overcoming that now with this storage that we're gonna talk about today. So this, this is a DC coupled system and they're relatively popular these days, uh, but normally they will combine the source circuit combiner box, uh, charge controller and the battery backup inverter all into one 
one one box. The batteries will be in a separate uh, uh, container. The standby loads will go to a different a standby load panel. And the other distribution panel uh, be the same. Um, and and so this is a basic idea of a, a DC coupled photovoltaic system. This is a basic AC coupled photovoltaic system. <clears throat> and this can work with any other loads so, and any other sources as well. It can work with wind or low head hydro. What happens is you generate DC electricity and you use a straight grid connect inverter, which is a current source. Okay. But in order to be a current source, it has to use whatever voltage is desired by the standby loads. So therefore, you're producing generally uh, 12240 uh, volts electricity here. And uh, this goes to the standby loads at an efficiency of about 98%. So um, uh, when your solar is operating with this direct grid connect inverter, about 98% of the electricity you're making with the solar actually goes to the standby loads. And uh, since all of these things that are connected in this circuit uh, follow the IEEE uh, 7 or 1547 rule, it means they have to act as current sources and they have to synchronize with the utility voltage or something that looks like utility voltage that in fact acts as a voltage source as opposed to a current source. So the battery backup inverter is there. Anything the standby loads don't need. Notice the standby loads get first shot at the electricity. And anything left over then goes to the battery backup inverter, which can either top up the storage and the storage batteries or send it up to the distribution panel, uh, which is the um, the interruptible loads, if there's still loads there. And uh, anything left over after the interruptible loads are happy, it goes to the utility. So this is, these are all partial backup, the two diagrams, but it's also possible to do a whole house or a whole, whole building backup uh, with a slight modification of the diagrams. But uh, this one, this is about as detailed as we're gonna get. From here on, we're gonna look at some of the larger picture. But this is just to recognize that folks have been doing battery storage for a long time. And these kinds of uh, systems are, are very common. Um, oh, just yesterday, I saw, I guess, uh, uh, about 30 kilowatt hours of uh, battery storage came through across my computer screen uh, for me to look at. And, and so, yeah, people, especially in Florida, uh, with, with, with hurricane threats <clears throat> and other areas where there are threats of ice storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever, where people want, or if they have uh, a need for uh, emergency power, uh, solar is becoming very popular. We don't dare call solar emergency power because emergency power by definition has to be provided by fossil fuel sources, even though the solar backup power can be provided in milliseconds. And then the emergency backup fossil power, you can take up a couple hours to get that connected if necessary. So, so there's some interesting things to read about another day about uh, how these things are going on. But anyway, basic, two basic systems, DC coupled, AC coupled. Now let's take a look at, uh, well, what do you do if you have a 5,000 watt system, 4,000 watt system, but you need 80,000 watts? Well, you scale it up, very simple. And it might be putting a whole lot of these uh, inverters in parallel. It might be a whole lot of uh, uh, batteries in parallel. The point is you can get up to 80,000 watts or more, even in a residential or small business. Uh, using this, the very the techniques we just looked at. Um, there may be some smaller energy storage. Uh, I, I can envision there will be days when that vacant lot at the end of the block, instead of have, having a house in it, it will have a, a building that's full of battery storage. 
or whatever other stories might come down the, 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 the road in the next 30 to 50 years. <clears throat> um, another important thing for storage is electric fields, vehicles and smart garages. We, we have a plug-in hybrid that has 17 kilowatt hours of uh, battery backup. And that 17 kilowatt hours of electricity will allow us to drive the car 60 miles or if it were bi-directional, then one day it will be, and a lot of the Teslas are already wired that way, then the utility can ask your electric vehicle for, to provide some electricity when it needs it. And then the electric, electric vehicle can charge up again um, at another time when the utility has excess electricity available. So uh, look for these, uh, the electric vehicles are all over the place already, and there's a whole lot more they're going to be sold because they are mean machines as far as uh, muscle power, uh, but also uh, they are less expensive to drive, less expensive to maintenance, maintain. So uh, uh, they're selling fast. They're here to stay. Uh, smart garages are coming online and uh, we'll be seeing more and more of them. And those are simply garages where the vehicle charger talks to the utility and negotiates the price for the electricity that it might sell to the electricity from the vehicle or might buy from the uh, utility for the electric vehicle, depending on the economics of the situation. Microgrids are another thing that uh, are coming up. We'll, have, we'll pick, talk a little bit about that, that towards the end. And so in all of these things, energy storage is important. So let's get on and talk a little bit about energy storage, solar, wind, they make energy, but the amount of energy they make is not necessarily proportional to the amount of power. Is my picture up in that corner getting in the way of the slide? Maybe it is. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna turn off my camera and that way you can see the whole screen just in case. <clears throat> okay, so um, the, the thing about PV and wind is they're variable sources. Everybody knows the sun doesn't shine at night. The wind blows kind of when it wants to. And so we need to adapt to that. And the question is, how are we going to? Large thermal sources <clears throat> can also benefit from energy storage because it can take more than 24 hours to ramp up a big... Uh, a nuclear power plant because they're very unstable and you got to be very careful as you power them up so they don't uh, start them up too fast and they get out of, out of, out of hand, kind of like global warming. Or uh, the other thing is um, uh, big coal fire plants that takes a while for those things to hold to, to, to fire up. There's a lot of thermal inertia involved there. Um, one nice thing about rotating thermal sources is they can follow the load. And the variable sources only generate electricity when the conditions are right. In other words, the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. And they're not particularly fussy about what the system load is. They, they need to know where they're in, what their energy source is doing. So there needs to be a reconciliation between on following the load. Uh, if a variable source produces excess energy, um, what are you going to do with it? If it's more than the grid needs, are you just going to shut the source down? That's what you have to do with the fossil sources. You got to just turn off the switch. You might keep it rotating at uh, 1800 RPM, but it shuts down. It doesn't send electricity other than in, unless it's needed. Uh, of course, that's very inefficient to have a fossil fired uh, generator running at grid frequency so that it can come on when you need it instantly almost, but it's using its burning fuel in the process of staying on that, that's not uh, delivering any energy to anybody. So you've got two choices with variable sources, either you curtail it or you put it somewhere. Now this, this is not new with renewable energy sources. Uh, this is, has been happening with nuclear for, for over 50 years. Um, the nuclear power plants uh, that were built 50 years ago 
uh, at night, they had excess electric energy and uh, they couldn't turn those nuclear plants down. Uh, they had to let them continue generating the energy. So what they started doing was pumping water uphill so that during the day they could reverse the direction and let that water run downhill and make electricity when the demand increased in the morning. Uh, so to some extent, energy storage is like curtailment because the efficiency of storage is not 100%. You're gonna lose some energy in the process of charging the batteries or pumping the water or compressing the air or whatever storage you might use. And you're gonna lose some additional energy when you recover the energy that you stored. So it, it's almost like curtailing it, it's just you're not curtailing it as much. You're saving as much as you possibly can. So um, why is storage interesting increase? Inter why is the interest in storage increasing? Well, I think we've hinted at that. Uh, storage technologies, volatility of fossil fuel prices. Uh, I mean, I, 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 with our plug-in hybrid, we don't stop at the gas station more than maybe once a year, but uh, I, I noticed that it seemed like a few weeks ago before the hurricane, uh, gas was less than $3 a gallon. And I saw a sign out in front of the station over the weekend was three fifty. dollars so when you're going from $3 to $3.50 a gallon in a week's time, um, that, that's a little bit disruptive. And uh, especially if you try and sell electricity at a constant rate without having to have huge fuel adjustment charges. Um, another thing that's happening is that ancillary services. Uh, uh, the, the, the folks who sit in the control rooms and and, and control whether you need to have various generation turned on, or what about load management devices and other kinds of things like that that you might be installing in a facility. So new stuff, new ideas, uh, new transmission and distribution. Uh, well, you know, try building a transmission line across the Everglades. Good luck. Um, and. Uh, even distribution sites are sometimes, uh, distribution lines sometimes are challenges to figure out how to run them. So, uh, but if you can store energy, then you can reduce the need for uh, additional wires out there because your stored energy can be used locally. Uh, that's where it's gonna be used first. So you don't necessarily have to bring in energy from far, far away. Um, and decreasing the levelized cost of energy for wind and, and, and a rapidly decreasing levelized cost of energy for PV is, is uh, also uh, firing up the interest in storage. Uh, levelized cost of energy, by the way, is simply if you buy a gasoline generator and you plan to sell the electricity it makes and pay for the generator as a, and the fuel, uh, with the price recovered from the electricity you sell, then is how much would you have to charge per kilowatt hour to keep your generator uh, maintained in full fuel and, and not lose money on the deal? And with, uh, say, a 5 kW fossil fuel generator, you're looking at almost a dollar a kilowatt hour. So uh, that, that would be the levelized cost of energy. Bigger systems, uh, natural gas, however, by right, levelized cost of energy is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of six cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, for, for, for uh, PV and even less for onshore wind and uh, not right, right in that same neighborhood for offshore wind. If, if that weren't true, the utilities wouldn't be building these facilities. So levelized cost of energy is simply what do you have to charge per kilowatt hour to recover the cost of the installation over the life of the system. And uh, right now, residential PV is in the neighborhood of seven cents. Uh, utility PV, neighborhood of three cents. That plus or minus a couple of cents, depending on exactly what the technology is and where the location is and how, compl how complicated it was to uh, prepare the land for the installation. Um, and some people actually think carbon dioxide from thermal sources causes global climate change. Now, we're not even gonna make that argument, but for those of us who do believe that, 
um, it makes us very interested in energy storage to take the place of uh, burning fossil fuels. <clears throat> now, we need to make a distinction between storage and capacity because storage is in energy units like kilowatt hours or joules, but normally kilowatt hours since we're talking about electricity. And capacity, which would be watts or kilowatts or megawatts or gigawatts, depending on the level we're talking about. Um, most energy storage mechanisms, particularly batteries, but even if you talk about pumping water uphill, uh, the motor that drives the pump, the pumps that electricity does not run at 100% efficiency. Okay, <clears throat> so as the power demand increases from a given source, usually the available energy decreases because of internal losses in the source. So every source will be rated for how many kilowatt hours of capacity, and it will also be rated at how many kilowatts of, energy, uh, of, of power that it can provide. A uh, typical small energy storage system, a 10 kilowatt hour system will provide about 3,900 watts. And beyond that, it, it, it cuts back because after that point, the losses in the battery system there are uh, unjustifiably large. So storage systems are rated by their energy and their power uh, ratings. So that, and that's important in terms of the design process. And so um, some is generally just called energy storage and lead acid deep discharge energy, uh, sorry, deep discharge lead acid is typically energy storage. It does not provide high amounts of current uh, the shallow discharge lead acid is what you use for starting a vehicle. And that gives you lots of power, but not very much energy. So that's what you get with capacity storage. So depending on how you build your storage, you may build it to provide energy over a 24 hour period or power over a 10 second period for starting a motor. Um, some storage, Sources can do both. Lead acid, no, forget it. On the other hand, lithium sources oftentimes are rated for providing either energy or power. A capacitor is the sort of thing that provides capacity but not much energy. An inductor provides, uh, you know, a rotating flywheel uh, can provide capacity but not that much energy. But they're, both are important because both have uh, the, the capacity serves an instantaneous function and the energy serves a longer term function. If you want both, you need relatively low internal resistance and you need, be able, you need to be able to discharge it either fast or slow. Okay, so just some things, useful pieces of information about energy storage if we're gonna get serious about building some. Uh, here's what happens with lead acid batteries, for example, the faster you discharge them, the faster they run out of charge. So the, 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 the fewer amp hours you get from the battery because what happens is uh, you lose, you warm up the battery faster. You have uh, square of the current times resistance internal to the battery is the heat produced within the battery that is not available for operating any external load. So this is a typical curve. This is for lead acid. For other technologies, the curves won't drop off quite as fast. Uh, the lithium technologies, for example. Why did my phone? Oh, okay, I forgot. So there are generally three classes of energy storage. And one is for power quality and regulation. And that's like the flywheel or the capacitor or really good uh, lithium ion storage. And the time that they need to discharge is just seconds to minutes. And that's to keep something running or to start something or something. But mostly you notice power quality and regulation. If there's a glitch, the 
transient stability is at, is at risk. So let's say you lose generation capacity. You want to try to make sure you dump some energy into the system very quickly to keep the system stable and online. Then there's bridging power, which would be contingency, contingency reserves. And the time frame on this is minutes to about an hour. And we'll look at some of these different technologies as we move through and there's energy management, which is used for load leveling, firm capacity transmission distribution. And that's hours. And that's the sort of thing like uh, compressed air energy storage or uh, uh, pumping water uphill. Uh, hydro power. Okay, here's an example. In South Australia, uh, you can notice there's a lot of uh, wind power down there. And they were having some problems with instabilities on the grid. And uh, back in 2017, uh, Tesla folks were presented with this problem and they came back with a proposed solution is that here's the deal. <clears throat> we will build a system for you in 100 days, that's one zero zero, a little over three months. And it will solve your problem. And if it doesn't, you get it for free. Well, how can you pass up a deal like that? So here's what happened. Yeah, uh, here was the challenge, 100 megawatts in 100 days, megawatt a day. OK, uh, so they delivered, first of all, they delivered the 100 megawatts into the Australian national grid. And uh, this was after it was up in operation uh, because a coal fire plant happened to trip off and 140 milliseconds later, 0.14 seconds later, this 100, there was 100 megawatts being delivered to the grid to replace this coal fired plant. So um, that, that, that's a pretty fast response. And this has 129 megawatt hour capacity. So in other words, it will deliver 100 megawatts for 1.29 hours or 10 megawatts for 12.9 hours and actually for a little more than 12.9 hours if you want to use the energy from it that way. So there's some big batteries out there and uh, they've been proven to work just fine. This thing went online just before the, it, the late November of 2017. And here's some references if you want to read about it. Um, and here's another one here. So again, if you order the slides of this presentation and you want to read about any of these things, I'll be giving you the references uh, on the slides so you can look them up in case you get bored watching TV over the weekend or something like that. Although football season here, and then you may need to wait until after Christmas or well, no, when does football season end next March? Uh, who knows when? And, and, and anyway, and everybody likes football. Uh, my boss is a formal, former football player. Um, here's what that Tesla battery did in South Africa. Here's what, what happens. They, they've got, uh, it charges at night, as you can see. So the, the batteries will load on the system at night, fills it up. And then during the daytime, when they need some extra boost of power, uh, it, they reverse the direction of power and it provides power to the grid. So uh, pretty straightforward. They use it when they need it. And here's some more reference on reading about that. <clears throat> Other battery projects in 2017, some in the United States, some China, Japan. And uh, there's a project going with a thousand battery systems using various technologies that uh, have five megawatt capacity. But you can see the relative capacities and um, notice that vanadium flow and sodium sulfur are some interesting flow batteries, new technology stuff, big time storage, 800 megawatt hours. That is a lot of megawatt hours and 200 megawatts. <coughs> so imagine 200 megawatts for four hours is going to give you 800 megawatt hours. So that we're talking big batteries here and Chinese are working on this and the J Japanese have uh, decided they're going to uh, build a uh, sodium and sulfur project and this back in 2017. So um, the United States is not the only game in town. Let's face it, we are actually playing catch up right now.
So here's another article you can read about this. What about fuel costs and no fuel costs? That makes things interesting because with wind and solar, there's no fuel cost. So if you can run these things without having to burn any fuel, you want to run them as much as possible to get your money's worth out of them. Whereas, you, so you, you really don't want to shut these things down. You want to keep running as much as possible. And of course, when they make the electricity, then something else doesn't have to make it. But when they're not making it, well, then you have to use some other energy source. So when, when, when you cut back on your thermal sources, they use less fuel, but they also produce even more or less electricity because the electric, they're less efficient at, at, at low load rates. So you want uh, to get the most out of a thermal source is running at about 70 to 80% capacity. You cut it back to 20% capacity and that becomes a lot more expensive electricity. Okay, so uh, uh, fuel is, is there's an interesting conflict here between no fuel costs and fuel costs. Because if you don't burn that fuel in a fossil source, you can't sell any electricity and you can't then pay back the investment in the source. So utilities are having a lot of fun now trying to decide whether to build any new thermal sources and they've pretty much given up on coal and, 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 and they went out of business with uh, petroleum 50 years ago almost, 40 to 50 years ago. So the only thing is natural gas. So, Energy production is what the thermal source operating costs got paid for, and that's based on fuel use. So the dollars per megawatt hour of thermal has to go up to pay for the plan. But the way it used to be is the solar energy was a whole lot more expensive, <clears throat> but now the prices come down. So this is what's happening. The approach might be to just decommission inefficient thermal and plants. Well, um, they're certainly decommissioning inefficient thermal plants. And in some cases, the footprint of that plant is being used for storage and uh, probably it's going to happen more often because what do you do with an out-of-date coal plant? Well, uh, put some big batteries in place of it. Uh, Variable source behavior, that's pretty obvious. Uh, the net load is the, I mean, the load itself is in green on the top draft here. And it, you know, it's varies about from day to day. So now we're going to uh, add some wind power down there on the red in the bottom. And of course, wind power is not terribly predictable, maybe from one, one hour to the next, or maybe within six or 12 hour window, you can probably tell that <clears throat> tomorrow it's not going to be windy, but today it is. But you can see the slopes here are significant because the wind will blow and then it'll stop blowing in a relatively quick time. And the energy made by the wind uh, is not proportional to the velocity of the wind either because uh, you've got force times velocity is power. And then uh, the force of the wind is proportional to the square of the velocity. So you got a very nonlinear relationship here. And uh, the power goes up very rapidly as the wind velocity goes up, but it also goes down very rapidly as the wind velocity goes down. So uh, the thing to look at here is the net load. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, yeah, the net load after the wind takes up part of it. And the thing to look at is the slopes on these curves. And note the steep slope on the blue curve compared to the green curve means things turn on and off a whole lot faster. And, and that is something that needs to be dealt with because the difference between the blue curve, curve and the green curve has to, right now it's, it, it, it's the red that's doing that, but if the net load, uh, has to be provided by, by other sources. And those other sources need to be able to come on really fast. And we just saw how that can happen with that lithium ion battery situation in Australia. So um, 
here's some different technologies back in 2011. <clears throat> It's interesting to compare the, the 2017 Tesla lithium ion. If you uh, the curve it gives you uh, uh, depends how many megawatts you want, and this was the existing technologies back then, and then how fast you want to discharge it. And lithium ions back then, uh, if you want a megawatt of lithium ion power, and I'm not sure. I think you might be able to see my cursor. Uh, you had to consider it has to discharge in six, only about 10 minutes um, if you want a megawatt. Whereas if you only wanted uh, 10 kilowatts, then you get 10 hours worth with lithium ion technology back in 2011. Then there was zinc bromide technology, nickel metal halide, nickel cadmium, um, compressed air energy storage, pump storage hydro. And the pump storage hydro, you get lots of power for a long time because you just pump a whole lot of water uphill. But look at how technology progressed between 2011 and 2017. That, that Tesla battery can provide that 100 megawatts <coughs> for 1.29 hours. It, it, it's, it's way 100 times um, more efficient and, and more, more capable, I guess would be a way to say it, than the lithium technology of 2011. It's moved from here up to here. So that's almost a thousand times more uh, in, 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 in less than 10 years. So where we're going between here and 20, uh, 2030 is a good question. I see a Q&A up there with two. Let's see what we got here. Okay, how am I defining standby loads, critical loads versus the branch circuits off the distribution panel? Okay, um, <clears throat> stand, standby loads are, are the same as critical loads, okay? Uh, in, in, oh, that, Russell, I'm sorry, that was way back at 1024, you asked that question. Um, yeah, the standby loads are loads that are uninterruptible. And, and uh, a lot of people call them critical loads, the loads you don't want to lose. Um, <clears throat> and the branch circuits on the distribution panel, um, those are the um, non, uh, what do I say, the, the, the interruptible loads. So when the utility goes down, those circuits, you can turn them off. And uh, certain loads, you really can get along without them. Whereas there are certain critical loads like being able to charge your telephone or run your microwave oven or, you know, you name it, whatever your critical load might be. <clears throat> okay, so it, it, uh, standby is the same as critical. It's loads that are powered up by the storage system when the utility goes down. Okay, Karen, let's see what we got here. Roughly, what's the projected life of these large PV projects such as Musk's? Um, do they just switch out the cells? Um, well, you can see that it's, uh, there, there, there's a bunch of uh, uh, similar looking structures there, aren't they? <clears throat> I don't think they know what the lifetime is because they're so new, but I, I, I'm sure they project them uh, for the individual units. They're probably projecting them out. Um, well, one, one way to look at it is uh, the warranty on the battery pack in an electric car. And uh, the warranties are becoming better and better because they're noticing the, the technology is becoming more and more reliable or it was already pretty reliable and they just didn't realize how reliable it was. <clears throat> so um, large PV project like Musk with batteries, um, I think they're projecting the life of these at least 20 years. And that gets uh, one of the things they have to do on the math on uh, for the levelized cost of energy storage. And that is, uh, affects what they have to charge for the uh, energy that these storage systems provide when needed. So that's a good question, very good question. And I'm sure they switch out cells if they have problem, uh, consider, and, and, and I, I don't have an answer how often, but I'm guessing uh, just based on the lead acid systems I'm familiar with that have installed more than 10 years ago, a friend of ours 
had a has a battery backup system that's almost 15 years old and they have not had to replace their batteries yet uh, we've checked it and they they still work i wish i had a battery backup system but it is not something i can do in my condominium unfortunately okay uh karen and russell thank you for the questions i'm gonna uh answer that uh uh Maybe I just click answered. Yeah, okay. There we go. So as you can see, there are a lot of technologies out there. And I've only shown the improvement in the lithium, but most of these are improving in their ratio of um, a power to time um, curve. They, they, they're doing more, top, more power for a longer time. Um, here, here's the, uh, the, the, the explanations of all the abbreviations of sodium sulfur and so forth. And whenever you see an REFS, by the way, that, that's the Renewable Energy Future Study. So if you just order up that study, you can, uh, it, it's fairly long. And uh, there, there's a lot, uh, a lot of good information. And in. let's see, we got Q&A. I'm looking at, let's look at chats and Q&As again. Um, David is betting on solar. What emerging energy source on technology will be dominant in five years? Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I have the, uh, the, the projections I have in another webinar, but, uh, I agree with David, the uh, rate of increase of, uh, deployment of solar, is going up really fast. One of the things solar has going for it is there is no place, almost no place where you can't use solar. And I'm saying, well, if you're obviously if you're in the middle of a forest and things, but the sunlight available, uh, if it's made available, <clears throat> is almost anywhere. And furthermore, the power production from solar is directly proportional to the sunlight intensity. So uh, you don't have that, that, that same major difference. Whereas wind, there are certain layers. Um, I once talked to a friend up at uh, uh, Next Era Energy about uh, whether it was a smart idea to put windmills up and down the turnpike. And they said, if it was a smart idea, we would have done it already. So, so the, the wind people know where the wind is and uh, they know where to, uh, Okay, let's see, solar through which batteries? Good question. I can tell you that the popular battery right now in solar is a lithium ion, it's the uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate type. And uh, in terms of uh, solar panels to carry the day and batteries to carry the night, in a residential, that's not a very complicated thing to do. Most of the systems we do are designed in order to do that. And the typical residential system is going to have around 10 kilowatts of solar. And it, if it wants enough energy to carry nighttime loads and include some air conditioning, then you're looking at uh, roughly 20 kilowatt hours of storage. So let's see, that's, uh, uh, oh, from John, okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, solar bet there, John. And let's see what else we got. Uh, okay. All right, we'll click that one out. And uh, back to Q and A's again. How am I defining standby? Okay, I already did that. Uh, oh, okay, uh, that's interesting. Um, that didn't go away after I clicked it. All right, now I know that, usually it does. There's another chat just popped up. <clears throat> Yeah, no, David, no, no, no question. Lithium is uh, is going to be the dominant technology for the next five years. That that's the only. I mean, we we do very little lead acid, and occasionally a replacement set of lead acid batteries for an older system where they don't want to move into lithium. But I recently saw a case where an older system, ten years old or so, um, that the uh, I was looking at John's comment, where, where, where they replace lead acid with uh, lithium. And the, uh, when you do that, you have to change your charge control mechanism. Uh, the, 
the black swan on lithium is that um, <clears throat> they, they, they you, you don't dare charge them over 100% capacity. And, and so, uh, yeah, there's some people who are concerned about them being uh, fire hazards. And I refer you to gasoline, which is quite a fire hazard and not very easy to put out. Um, I am not aware of any lithium accidents anywhere with, with hundreds of uh, megawatts of lithium now being installed, having been installed in, 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 in automobiles and in solar systems. Uh, the only issue I can remember was way back with the DC-8. Um, oh, yeah, okay, here's a PDH source message. Please uh, type them in Q&A. So, right, um, I will go back and look at Q&A now and see what's there. <clears throat> what do we got? Uh, oh, that's the same two that have been there all along. Okay. Round trip efficiency. Um, in order to compare apples to apples, or let's say lead, lead, lead acid to uh, lithium, uh, we need to talk about uh, power in versus power out, or energy in versus energy out. And since most systems now are AC systems, even though the batteries themselves are DC, Usually you have AC coming in, going into a rectifier circuit that converts the AC to DC to charge the batteries. And then the batteries discharge out through an inverter that converts their DC to AC. There are inefficiencies in both of these processes, but generally not more than overall inefficiency, the round trip efficiency. Uh, for lead acid is generally considered to be about 90%. That changes with the rate of discharge. The faster you discharge, the less efficient. Um, the slower you discharge, the more efficient in terms of round trip efficiency. A lithium, I've seen advertisements as high as 96% uh, round trip efficiency. And that's probably uh, something like a, a rate of discharge about 10 hours to completely discharge. Uh, lead acid, you generally don't want to Charge, uh, charge it faster than over a five hour period. Lithium sometimes can be charged in one hour or less. So that means you get more power per uh, kilowatt hour out of them as well. Uh, so generally it's the AC round trip efficiency that's used to compare the uh, uh, the various storage sources. And for batteries, the AC to AC round trip efficiency is typically between 70 and 90% uh, for the reasons just, just mentioned. For pumped hydro, about 70 to 80% round trip efficiency. So that's your loss, losses in the motors and the pumps of uh, moving that water uphill and then having it come back downhill and turn the generator. Compressed air, 50 to 65%. So, you know, these numbers here are pretty important numbers in terms of determining what you want to use. Uh, batteries, of course, uh, permitting and installation uh, time on that's a whole lot uh, faster than pumped hydro or compressed air where you're trying to pump air into a cavern underground. Um, flywheels are 60 to 80% efficient. So 80% uh, efficient flywheel is not bad. That, uh, if we have some mechanical engineers on a part of the program here, um, I uh, should be happy to know that there are some commercially available flywheels, if you're not already aware, that will easily dump a megawatt very quickly into the system. Um, the data uh, on these asterisk items are from the uh, Interstate Renewable Energy Commission Council. Sorry, IREC, I forgot whether C is for commission or, or council. But anyway, uh, IREC is a very reputable uh, outfit for, for data. They've been around for a while. Um, so so uh, IREC is something to look, if you're looking for the answer to a question uh, on, on storage, <clears throat> there's a pretty good chance that you'll find the answer in some IREC publication. Everybody of course wants to see a diagram of how do you pump water uphill? Well, I guess that probably doesn't surprise anybody. 
but the interesting thing is these were originally done for pumping water uphill at night when nuclear plants were working. <coughs> now, as the mixture of wind and solar becomes higher and higher, it's highly likely that these storage things will start pumping water uphill during the day when the sun is shining and using it to flow downhill at night to meet the nighttime load. So who would have guessed 50 or 60 years ago that these things would be running backwards in the 2020 timeframe? So it all depends on when, do you, when, when you have excess generation, whether you want to pump hill up or downhill. And just time-wise, it takes about a half an hour to switch over from pumping uphill to pumping downhill. Um, here's your installed cost of um, pump storage hydro up to 1990. Um, why do I just have this data? Well, it's what was in that study. But also, they haven't built a whole lot more pump storage hydro since 1990. Uh, back then, it was they're trying to make up for the nuclear. A lot of these stations are up in uh, along Highway Two in northern Massachusetts, for example. There's four or five of these up there. You can't even see them. You drive by, you don't realize they're up there. You see a few windmills, a few things like that. But uh, it gives you an idea of how much these things were costing per kilowatt of uh, uh, of storage. Yeah, using two thousand and nine dollars, um, so the cost was somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars per kilowatt, up to almost two thousand over nineteen hundred. So this is these are numbers that the utilities were justifying as uh, uh, feasible in order to make sure that they made full use of the power output of the nuclear plants. Uh, nineteen ninety, there was no appreciable solar online. It was way down in the noise. Nobody would have noticed it. So uh, here, here, here's some information on pump storage hydro. Uh, average efficiency about 75%. The newer ones can do 80% or even more for round trip efficiencies. And, that, and that, that's not half bad. Where is it? Here's a map of where it is. And again, if you really want to know where it is, order up a set of the slides. I am not about to talk about every one of these. You can see the Smoky Mountains are popular. <clears throat> the, the Rocky Mountains are popular, but particularly along the Pacific Coast Range there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of hydro uh, in, in Washington State. And of course, one reason for that is Washington State has the, uh, uh, a lot of hydro plants along the Columbia River. And nice to be able to save some of that water to use it when you need it. So where, who has the stored hydro? Is it just the United States? Are we the only ones doing this stuff? Nope, no we're not. 19% for us, 19% for Japan. They're a little bit smaller than we are. 27% of the world's stored hydro is in China and 35% is other places. So uh, there's other folks out there who are working on these. Okay, there's another question. Let's see what we got. Uh, Julius, battery technology life versus repetitive depth of discharge. Um, uh, that, that, that's a really good question and uh, Julius because I, there's a lot of answers. And this is not something people have been trying to figure this out for over the years. Uh, it, it's generally agreed that the deeper the depth of discharge, the fewer discharge cycles that are available. <clears throat> this seems to be bearing it out in, in that the batteries over at my friend's house are 15 years old, but he rarely uses them because we haven't had that many hurricanes that have taken his power away for that amount of time over that time. Um, so, so different technologies that's generally rated in cycles, and this is in cycles of, uh, uh, say, from 100% down to 20% capacity. And it ranges somewhere in the 3,000 to 6,000 cycle, and it all depends on whose batteries, but you can look up that information in the battery manufacturer's websites. It'll give you some idea 
my own personal experience is that if you don't discharge it as much, <clears throat> it um, you you can do more cycles. But if you look at I thought my feeling, and this is just my own feeling from an engineering standpoint with a little bit of uh, science background, is that uh, it seems to be measured in kilowatt hours or megawatt hours over the lifetime. So therefore, if you use 100 kilowatt hours a day out of your batteries, uh, it will maybe last, and I don't think it's a linear relationship either, but it may last uh, only half as long as if you use say 20 kilowatt hours a day as opposed to 50 kilowatt hours a day. So there's uh, undoubtedly an interesting nonlinear relationship. That's my thought. I wish I had a better answer. But anyway, thank you for asking a question. Uh, I am not afraid to say I don't know the answer. I'll give you the best I can come up with. Um, so, so here's where the plants are. And um, pumped hydro, what's the capacity? And it also notice on top of these blue lines towards 1990 and up the compressed air is uh, adding a little bit to the dominant worldwide storage. So we've been talking about a lot about batteries, but right now the dominant worldwide storage, at least as of 2012, has been pumped hydro. And it's still, pumped hydro is still the dominant energy storage out there. But um, batteries are very quickly increasing, very rapidly. Here's some of the recently proposed pumped hydro pumped uh, uh, storage hydro plants. Uh, uh, four of them in California, a couple of Utah, a couple in Austria, Germany, and Slovenia. And uh, dollars per kilowatt. Um, of course, the pumped hydro, well, there's a whole lot more cycles. They're talking, you're talking hundreds of thousands of cycles, as opposed to uh, fives or tens of thousands of cycles. So 10 to 20 times more cycles with pump storage. Um, but some of these are, they're, they're canceling, canceling them out. Uh, some they're planning to build, but a lot of them, uh, uh, they, they didn't quite finish them off. So, and, 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 and this is because of the uncertainty over batteries. Whoops, what have I done? I clicked the wrong thing. Wait, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Cancel that. Boy, I almost said leave the webinar. How do I, maybe I can move this up. Yeah, I don't know if everybody else can see what's on my screen right now. Um, I accidentally view, I don't want to view. I want to view full screen. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what have I done? Uh, escape to get out of full screen mode. All right, we're almost back. I just don't know. Maybe I click this X up here. Yeah. No, I don't want to leave the webinar. Don't tell me that. Folks, I'm really sorry. I didn't expect this. I. I'd like to look at uh, look at the chat box, please. Tell me if you see a, a a thing with Professor Roger PDH source up at the top of your screen. That's that's uh, that's uh, getting in the way of the slide. Yeah, uh, Roger, Roger, just share your screen again. Okay, I, I, okay, that's probably the idea. Uh, let me turn off my share screen and come back. Okay. Uh, Wait a minute. There you go. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm not the only one either, I'm sure. Okay. So um, just uh, an idea of what's out there or what they were hoping to do. 
and uh, where are they going to do it? This is where they want to, and it's pretty obvious. Uh, these places are places where they have big hills, mountains. So uh, again, this comes out of the uh, 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 the RE, the Renewable Energy Futures Study. So this is in their uh, material. Uh, I'm going to look at what time it is here. 11.15. All right, yeah. <clears throat> if you want to do compressed air energy storage, I don't know if you've ever filled a uh, scuba tank or watched somebody fill it, but they put them in, a, in, in, in water because when you compress air, it gives off a lot of heat. So you need to have a way of uh, a heat exchanger to remove that heat. And when you let it go again, decompress it, it, it acts as a refrigerant, so it comes out cold. And uh, that, that's, of course, the throttling, throttling valve effect. And all we want that air to do is to turn a, a turbine. So uh, there's some heat exchange that has to take place when you compress air. But basically, this is not a whole lot of uh, real estate above ground, but uh, takes a fair amount of real estate underground. And it has to be fairly tightly sealed so the air doesn't leak out. So anyway, this is a diagram of compressed air. And not everybody spends their Sunday morning reading about compressed air energy storage. So just so you have an idea of what we got. Um, so there are a lot of different places where you can do compressed air. Um, and it's about 30 minute turnaround and something like 50% better turnaround than a gas turbine. Like if you want to turn on a gas turbine to meet some uh, instantaneous peak, uh, you can meet an instantaneous peak electricity with uh, compressed air about 50% faster than, than you can with the gas turbine uh, with current technology. Uh, let's see what's in the chat here. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Okay, yeah, we're, we're back in business. <clears throat> I had to unshare to get rid of uh, some unwanted material that was blocking the picture. Okay. Um, if you want a successful aquifer storage cavern, and again, here, again, I'm just going to click this stuff. It has to be deep enough, wide enough. I mean, it's pretty obvious stuff. And uh, Again, if, if this is something you want to come back to, order the slides, no charge. Uh, you get them, I think, in a PDF format. So you get all these words and all these commentary uh, that you can look at at your leisure. Where is the compressed air sites possible? Well, it all depends on how you want to store it, uh, whether you want porous rock. I was very surprised to see that we down here in Florida have bedded salt. Uh, possibilities and, and along my coast is about the only place in Florida where we can't do compressed air energy storage underground. So uh, we have to figure another way to do it and uh, we'll probably use batteries down here. But uh, so it all depends on technology. There are a lot of places in the United States where we can do it. If you want to build a compressed air energy storage in a salt cavern, here's uh, materials, uh, build materials for you. Uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on this one. Uh, I see there's another question I think just popped up. Uh, uh, Tata Motors has a compressed air car or used to. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that's probably about the equivalent compressed air. I remember the Tata. I haven't seen any lately. Um, I, I'm guessing it's not uh, 4,500 PSI is really, really big. I mean, that's big time. And uh, I don't know whether they need some special uh, heat removal facility for that. Um, I just don't know the answer on that one, Russell. But, but you know, we know the technology. Uh, as you compress air, it gets warm. So you got to get rid of that heat. And how they do it, I don't know, unless they charge it very slowly. Uh, it could be just like my, uh, uh, I, I'm charging my 17 kilowatt hours at the rate of uh, about uh, 1.4 kilowatt hours per hour. So uh, it takes 
six or seven or eight hours to do a charging. And, and maybe it took six or seven or eight hours to get up to 4,500 PSI. Hard to tell, probably not quite that long, but probably not as fast as you get 2000 PSI in a uh, scuba tank, which is, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, Y'all are coming up with some really good questions and I want you to know I appreciate that. It gives me things to think about. Um, okay, what are some of the emerging energy storage technologies? Well, fly whales. And they are now commercially available and what they mostly do is regulate the frequency. If the utility is getting overloaded, their frequency tends to go down because their rotating generation tends to be have more torque on it as they and, and that tends to slow it down. So if you kick in a flywheel, the flywheel, you know, well, of course, if you take energy out of a flywheel, uh, it's going to slow it down, isn't it? So is, does that mean it's going to change the frequency? And the answer is no, because the flywheel feeds a big inverter. And the inverter is extremely carefully regulated to do exactly 60 hertz regardless of the speed of the flywheel. So the flywheel makes some DC electricity, goes into the uh, uh, inverter to make good, solid, clean AC electricity. So, but, but you can't do it for very long, about 15, 20 minutes of frequency regulation while you get another source online. Capacitor, same thing, very, very fast response for voltage stability. Superconductor magnets. Uh, technically speaking, magnetic fields come from currents and capacitive energy storage is in terms of voltage. So capacitors do voltage stability and magnets do current stability, uh, but both are important. Uh, magnets tend to, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, we're talking stabilization. Everybody knows about capacitors using for improving power factor because they have a leading power factor. And the superconducting magnets in the same way would have a lagging power factor because they're, they're magnetic type. Um, high power batteries. Um, and we're not saying high energy, not high kilowatt hour, but high power batteries, okay? Uh, that you can turn on and dump a lot of power in. And this is kind of like the starting battery for an automobile. High power, but not high energy. They drain relatively quickly. Uh, big time possibility for energy storage is electric vehicles. Imagine uh, um, our particular vehicle uh, gets about four miles per kilowatt hour. Okay. And if you, um, and, and, and so we typically in an electric vehicle, you've got about 50 kilowatt hour storage if it's all electric and maybe more. The big Teslas have 100 get into trucks and school buses and things like that. You're getting into the multiple hundreds. <clears throat> so we had already talked about this at the beginning, electric vehicles with bi-directional chargers, the utility will be able to ask the electrical vehicle, electric vehicle when it's plugged in and if it's willing to sell some electricity. The vehicle negotiates with the utility on a price if it's set favorable to both parties the vehicle sells to the, the, the uh, utility. And then similar conversation goes on when utility electricity is cheaper where the utility, that vehicle buys from the utility. So uh, it, 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 imagine uh, 50 kilowatt hours average per car and then imagine 200 million or 150 million cars on the highway. Uh, that, that's a lot of kilowatt hours. Uh, and if they're all in bi-directional chargers, watch for this. This is coming down to Pike 10 years from now. I'm guessing this will be the dominant form of electrical vehicle charging, be bi-directional. Most of the Teslas, Teslas coming out right now are already equipped for that. Hydrogen, the only problem is the round trip efficiency in, in hydrogen is not too good, but fuel cells um, <clears throat> do have higher energy, energy density than air. So, um, uh, fuel cells have not been rolled out yet. They've been around for a long time. They've been having trouble um, entering the commercial market because of their, uh, uh, well, what 
dominates the commercial market price. And if you attach price to so price to pollution, uh, that can have an effect as well. Um, and weightlifting is the one that I think is really interesting. Uh, that's effectively pumping water uphill, except why not just have some steel blocks or some huge concrete blocks and some cranes. <clears throat> and just like a big crane came up the driveway and lifted our 40 ton air conditioner onto our roof, uh, it used a lot of energy to get that uh, thing up there. But then when, if they had just let it go, it would have returned a lot of energy to the system. And they've, they've been experimenting with these things in Europe. You might want to look up uh, um, weightlifting energy storage or crane energy storage, because I think it's Switzerland where they've been experimenting with these. And you can imagine a, a bunch of big cranes, 100 feet tall, 200 feet tall, whatever, um, in a big circle, back to back, lifting these huge weights and piling them up. And then when you need the, when there's excess uh, wind or solar, you, you pile up your weights. And when you need some energy at night or whenever, you grab those weights and let them descend to the ground again. And they give you energy back that you dump into the grid. And round trip efficiencies on these are remarkably high um, in, in the same neighborhood as, uh, as, as Mount Hydro. So uh, interesting stuff out there. How much does it cost? I'm not going to read this to you, but if you're interested, the uh, Lazards people uh, do levelized cost of storage analysis. And they do it kind of on a year to year basis. And um, again, order the slides if you want to look at these, but you see a lot of different uh, storage uh, possibilities here. Lithium ion, sodium thermal zinc, flywheels, uh, depending on the purpose and how much does it cost and the range of costs. So uh, this is information that's available. I'm going to look at Q&A here. Um, okay, uh, we've already done that. So, okay. So uh, again, here's some more of the Lazard's um, storage analysis because we didn't have enough room on the first chart. And again, I'm going to go a little more quickly here on that um, because, again, it's something that's easily read and understood. And we've got about 32 minutes left to go here. <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize there are actually six fairly prominent lithium technologies out there. Uh, the cell phones, the laptops, and the cameras use the densest storage, and that's the lithium cobalt oxide. Excuse me, drink your water, Paul. The one that's used probably the most is the lithium iron phosphate, there's a lot of that used. And the reason, well, what the, what, what one nice feature of lithium iron phosphate, it, it is more stable than most of the other lithium technology. And pretty much all of the photovoltaic storage is uh, lithium iron phosphate. And uh, a goodly number of the you know, uh, electric vehicles also use the lithium iron phosphate technology. The uh, lithium manganese oxide, I think, is ever so slightly more energy dense, kind of stuff you use as batteries for your drills, uh, medical uses, uh, battery backup, for example, and, and for hobby things like, uh, you know, let's say, uh, how many buddy, how, how many fly a drone? Highly likely that the batteries in your drone or, or electric airplane, whatever, are going to be lithium manganese oxide. A little bit lighter, a little higher energy density, more, more kilowatt hours per pound. <clears throat> and, and the one with the most kilowatt hours per pound, of course, is the one you want your cell phone. So that thing you can talk all day long and not run out of electricity. Or your laptop, or your camera. OK, and those are expensive, of course. Another cell phone battery, camera battery, Price per kilowatt hour on those batteries is, is pretty high. 
Uh, whereas if you get to the uh, LFP, the price per kilowatt hour is a whole lot lower than uh, lithium cobalt oxide. Okay, so again, uh, here, here's some numbers for you. Uh, tonight, somebody's gonna ask you, what did you learn today? And you're gonna say, well, I learned there's actually six different lithium technologies out there fairly commonly in use. And the one you probably have in your cell phone is lithium cobalt oxide. And that's all you're gonna to have to say for the meal. Somebody's gonna shut you up and say, okay, let's talk about something else instead. But at least you've made your contribution. And, and it's important for engineers to be able to make our contributions one way or another <clears throat> uh, and, and prove, prove what, what great conversationalists we are. <clears throat> wow, now isn't this a big sloppy thing? But if you wanna compare all of the batteries, this is a really good comparison here. Uh, specific energy density, watt hours per kilogram, okay? Uh, notice that the, uh, the biggest is the cobalt, 150 to 190, then the manganese and the phosphate. LIP. So, so, so the uh, lithium ion phosphate is uh, maybe only 75, 60 to 75% of the energy density as the uh, stuff in your, your, your cell phone, uh, but, but a whole lot less expensive. So it, it compares all kinds of nice stuff like cycle life. So here, here's your answer to your question. You know, somebody asked how many cycles can you do with 80% discharge? And, and uh, this is what th this particular reference says, uh, 500 to 1,000 cycles on and 1,000 to 2,000 cycles on the lithium iron phosphate. Uh, that, that's 2,000 cycles is uh, a pretty, uh, impressive number compared to lead acid at 200. So uh, uh, lithium ion batteries last about 10 times as long as lead acid batteries. I guess that's kind of what this is telling us. Okay, I forgot I had this slide. I should have said, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so again, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but if you wanna digest it again, order up the slides, simple, uh, process that is described in the Q and A's. Uh, and of course the energy density depend, uh, affects how much space you need for it. And this is really important in things like electric vehicles. Um, there's only a certain amount of, of battery space, but imagine a big Tesla that is, and it has a hundred kilowatt hours of storage. Um, you can see what's happening here. The, uh, I, I don't know why they draw the picture like this. I, would, I, I always like to see pictures where the, the variables are, are getting smaller because that usually means they're starting, they're costing less over time. But this one, as the, the, the further the graph points in that northeasterly direction, whatever you want to call it, uh, the better the source. And you can see what's happened uh, by 2000 even, uh, some major, major improvements have been made in energy density uh, in, in the various storage mechanisms. Um, and, and here's another one where watt hours per dollar storage costs have been increasing. Normally, I, I would imagine plotting this as dollars per watt hour and you want it to decrease. But if you plot watt hours per dollar, you obviously want it to increase. You want to get as many watt hours as you possibly can for your dollar spent. And again, you can see the technology is improving, the cost is coming down. So again, people are interested now. So the scientists and the engineers, they get busy and they start coming up with new ideas. Okay, so, uh, that little triangle there, upside down delta sign, is what the, the Australian Tesla, Tesla 2017 uh, has 2.15 watt hours per $2,005. And uh, in 2007, the DARPA Defense Advanced Research Projects, I never know what the last letter means in these acronyms, uh, they, they were hoping for a research goal of uh, 10 watt hours per dollar. 
And uh, my gosh, look at this, watt hours per dollar, 10 to the one, that would equal 10. And you go across and, and look at, there they are in the year 2000, uh, reaching that goal. So uh, not an unreachable door. Gar DARPA is, is pretty good at pro projecting reachable goals. That is. So, so let's look at some scenarios about storage and let's look at what time it is, 11.36. Okay, we're doing okay. Um, I'm looking at chats and Q's and A's and I think we don't have any new ones. That could have several meanings for an instructor. It could mean that I am putting everybody to sleep. I prefer not to think about that one. It could be that everybody is understanding every word I'm saying, and I can't believe that either. I, I feel a whole lot better when I see, see that Q&A box light up. So um, think about what you might like to talk about on these things, because I generally allow time to uh, uh, discuss the various items. And of course, if we get done a little soon, uh, then we'll go back and anybody will talk about whatever you want. Uh, and then I'll give you Roger's uh, predictions for the future, uh, which uh, are about not even worth what you might pay for a cup of coffee, probably. But anyway, yeah, all right. I'm going to be optimistic and, and hope that people are understanding what we've got here. And as I said in the beginning, I'm not. You're, nobody's learning how to build one of these systems. Um, but what we're looking at is what's out there, what's been out there, and what's probably going to be happening. So you know where you might want to uh, put some of your eggs. There's a question popped up. Russell, not saying. Oh no, no, that's not it. Where are we? Where did, where did that other one come? Oh, I know, I, I got no one down here. David, I'm glad you're not sleeping. Thank you, David. Russell, live aboard sailor in the summer. It's lead acid because they learn they provide cheap as It's true, lead acid is the cheapest first cost. Uh, eight, eight, eight years, yeah, okay. Uh, gel, AGM. <coughs> Oh, that's interesting. So you're using uh, flooded lead acid. Uh, that's interesting. Um, one thing that I think is, is the case for gel and AGM, if you're not careful with your charging, uh, they're supposed to recombine that, that uh, uh, hydrogen that's given off if you overcharge it and turn it into water and, and, and make sure that your acid uh, pH is right. Uh, so there's an advantage on lead acid batteries. You can make sure that your electrolyte is, uh, uh, that you've got enough water <clears throat> and that you have enough acid. And I'm guessing that you take good care of your batteries. Um, and in fact, they're about half the cost per kilowatt hour of the sealed batteries. <clears throat> but most people right now are not interested in, in, in maintaining them. So good point. Um, okay, okay, good. Uh, caught up now, I think. Let me see if my elevator goes down any further. Nope, here's Julius. What improvements in grid are needed for optimum integration of clean energy? We're going to take a look at that. Uh, definitely, the, the utilities are thinking very, very carefully about that. <clears throat> and uh, so we're, we're on our way towards an answer to that question. Okay, in fact, this is the beginning of it. <clears throat> um, in order to meet the 80% renewables by 2050, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that can happen. We could just not do anything other than just build storage. That's this constrained flexibility scenario says that nobody's going to let us do anything new other than just build storage. We're not going to do anything more as far as uh, uh, energy efficiency. We're not gonna improve on the technology. So we end up with a constrained flexibility scenario, the worst case. Then there's the 80% renewability, renewable energy with no technology improvement, simply a little more wind deployment. 
And then there's another scenario with high demand, 80% renewable energy with more wind and more PV deployment. And then there's a constrained resources as opposed to constrained flexibility. What if we don't have uh, uh, enough lithium out there or whatever? Or maybe there are, will be institutional constraints that says we can't mine lithium anymore. Now we can keep on pumping all the petroleum we want, but we can't mine lithium or something like that that could come out of whoever's government is in charge at the time. Um, or the constrained transmission model that says that we can't build any more transmission lines. So that's still no limit. And then there's the incremental technology improvement model that says maybe we'll start doing things smarter and better. And then there's the higher levels of CSP with thermal storage. In other words, the evolutionary technology improvement. Now, I can't imagine anybody believing that uh, uh, in a country like the United States or China or in, or in Europe or that there, there'd be any such thing as evolutionary technology improvement. Can you imagine that? So anyway, it's your, your best guess now, uh, whichever of these constraints, these scenarios is adopted is going to affect the amount of storage we're going to need. So uh, let's see where that takes us. Well, first scenario says we're going to need 152 gigawatts by 2050. If we do the second scenario, we're going to 142, all right, you can all read. The best case scenario is the 80% RAETI. We're only going to need 100, so it, there's 50% more capacity needed if we don't have innovation. But if we have innovation, we're going to have more. Now, the fact of the matter is, these are the numbers based on 80% in 2050. Uh, I've got numbers that show that we could, in fact, have 100% renewables by 2035 uh, and, and afford it for less than our current military budget. And so, we, we're looking at achievable things with uh, storage and renewables that uh, I think our future of our descendants and some of us is going to depend on. So, so um, here's some numbers of, of how much storage is going to be needed to keep the grid happy and the customers happy. <clears throat> this is done by fairly credible uh, I think this research has been peer reviewed and published by a National Renewable Energy Labs, pretty reputable outfit. Uh, the authors of the uh, system advisory model, great uh, estimating uh, software for estimating the production of power from a lot of different energy sources, particularly solar. When are we going to build it? Check this out, look at this, 2022, 2023, big time investment. This was before COVID-19 hit, but it's anticipated that a whole lot of money is gonna be spent within the next decade on storage. And uh, it's a matter of who's gonna be a part of that, uh, who's gonna ride on that train. Uh, because it, it, it's on the way. This is what they were projecting in 2012. Oh, more Qs and A's. Let's get up there and see how we got. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start at the bottom and work my way up. Have you seen a timeline for renewable energy taking over the base electrical load? Um, there, there, there are lots of time timelines. And in fact, what I just mentioned is that it, it's possible for it to happen by 2035 if we uh, play our cards right. Um, a, and, and, and it can be done for uh, less than a $500 billion a year investment. Um, and, and, and the military invest, uh, budget is somewhere around $650 billion a year. So, so um, and, and this is not government investment necessarily either. This is your money and my money that we have all options of uh, putting it into uh, investing in these these particular systems and getting pretty reasonable the best money my earnings my money is making right now is with next era and i'm not here to sell stock but every, last time i looked at my portfolio next era energy was the uh, the leader in terms of growth so uh, uh 
looking for a complete takeover by 2040, I don't think is unreasonable, David, unless something really weird happens. Uh, Julius, what improvements in the grid are needed for optimum integration of clean energy? Okay, we're talking about that now. We're going to talk a little more. Okay, so let's move to that. Um, you see what the storage does. It fills in the gaps where uh, the uh, basic energy source isn't available, whether it's nighttime, whether it's cloudy, or whatever the case may be. This is to back up uh, the renewable sources. Okay, so um, where are we going to put this storage capacity? Um, maybe in these places, lots of it in Texas, um, Texas and Florida, lots of it, the uh, two, two leading states in COVID-19, we get uh, the energy storage, how about that? You may sense a little frustration in my conversation about COVID, uh, living down here in the midst of the COVID capital of the world, but uh, uh, who knows, maybe it'll get better. I'm just getting older, that's all. And uh, I'm getting tired of sitting around the house and not being able to see my great grandson and things like that. Um, another Q and A came in here. Uh, uh, Karen in Nebraska, public power, looking at solar farms, public versus private energy groups and going clean. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I, I, can, I can tell you that uh, here in Florida, the, one of the projects they're working on is five megawatts of PV. It's private investors building it for a municipal utility. And uh, th this is becoming very popular investment groups uh, where you and I can put our money to uh, build solar farms. And uh, the, the, but then again, uh, uh, next era energy, the private energy, they're, they're going crazy on uh, building solar and wind. So um, I'm glad to hear that Nebraska, you, of course, you've got some nice areas for wind farms too, I think, and nice solar farms. Uh, and one thing that's needed when you put solar farms in areas that are far away from places where the electricity is going to be used in terms of what's needed to adopt the solar is, is uh, high voltage DC transmission lines to be able to move the solar long distances with minimal losses. So we probably will see more high voltage DC transmission lines. Uh, we'll be coming to that, I think, in just a minute. Time is 1148. Okay. Um, so this is where it's guess, well, educated guesses are being made as to where the storage is going to go. Um, And here's what the, uh, how, how much space does it take for the storage? And uh, sodium sulfide batteries with 7.2 hours of capacity. In other words, it, their, their full capacity can be uh, uh, depleted in 7.2 hours. It's about 211 square meters per megawatt. With sodium sulfide batteries in a 10 to 12 hour storage capacity, it's gonna take a little more space. Uh, 12 megawatts at um, 100 to 120 megawatt hour flow battery. That's about 850 square meters per megawatt. Again, I don't have to read this to you, uh, but this one, the 100 megawatts at 129 megawatt hours lithium ion storage is the one over in Australia. And that is using up about 100 square meters per megawatt of storage. Um, so you look at how many square meters does it take for generating solar electricity? How many square meters for generating wind? And if you're looking at lithium ion storage technology, the number of square meters it needs for lithium ion storage is, is significantly small than, smaller than the amount of uh, square meters it takes to generate uh, solar electricity. Of course, the nice thing about square meters and solar electricity is it's improving. You can get 200 watts per square meter now and uh, at, at peak sun. And uh, there's a lot of extra space on rooftops. 
that's not used for anything else. And, and, and putting solar on a roof that uh, makes your roof last longer, it holds it down better. A lot of advantages to putting solar on a roof. And to some of us, it looks a whole lot nicer than whatever other conventional roofing material might be there. Um, and to the people who have power after a hurricane, all of a sudden, to the neighbors who don't have that cold beer and hot water, uh, the solar on their neighbor's roof looks a whole lot better. So anyway, um, here, here, here's how much land these things take. Of course, you were all wondering the, the answer to that. Um, so now you know. <clears throat> and uh, how much water do some of these things use, like uh, compressed air and, and pump storage hydro? Um, well, compressed air is cooling water. Okay, and that's about two tenths of a gallon per kilowatt hour. And the closed cycle pump storage hydro, uh, you know, you lose some water that evaporates. So you need about three tenths of a gallon per kilowatt hour. Uh, is that a new question here? Uh, I see somebody figured out how to delete the old ones. Thank you, Hishan. Uh, okay, here we go. That's Nebraska Farm. We did that one. Okay, so, so here's water use for compressed air and pump storage hydro. And um, so how do we, and by the way, what's the water use for solar photovoltaic? Well, that's, that's uh, not storage, it's just generation, but uh, here in Florida, it doesn't use any water because the rain keeps them clean. But in the desert, the water usage is extremely small, even to keep them clean compared to the cooling water that's necessary in any of the fossil sources. So. Uh, uh, water is important these days, and in terms of storage and in terms of generation, uh, not very much is needed for generation with solar or wind and for uh, battery storage. So uh, what about batteries? Fairly expensive, limited cycle life. Uh, and so again, you have to, uh, here's what you need to do to improve on them. If you're looking at compressed air, which is probably going to be around for a long time, uh, it's a little more expensive, it's a little less efficient, and there are certain sites where the availability is not proven. So they need a lot of work to go into that and, uh, and pump storage hydro. Again, uh, don't do much of that here in Florida. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of hills out there. So we're not gonna do much of that, but we might do some of that weightlifting stuff, as long as we can get the neighbors to agree to these cranes lifting big blocks of concrete are beautiful. Um, anyway, uh, have to screen suitable formation. So here, here's the work, work, workload here that uh, anybody's interested in finding something to do. Um, here's some more stuff uh, in, in market and regulatory. Uh, <laughs> it's almost more work to be done in market and regulatory than, than the technical things. Um, and fortunately, there are a lot of good organizations who are working the market and regulatory issues. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, information here that's useful. You can glance at it, read it quickly. And uh, again, order the slides if you want to go further on this or just want to have it in a very small portion of your computer. Um, so here's a summary of storage characteristics for a lot of different stuff. Starting with lead acid, lithium ion, sodium sulfur, uh, flow batteries, flywheels, compressed air, and pump storage hydro. Round trip efficiency, discharge time, build time, how long does it take to build it? See, now that's something that's pretty important. Look at the those that are, are you build in, in a matter of months. And look at those that you build in a matter of 15 years, 10 times longer to do pump storage hydro than to deploy a lithium ion. And the build time, that includes the permitting time and the design time because some of the lithium time, uh, the build time, actually the construction of it doesn't take all that long uh, because they're all building blocks that you pop together and snap them in place. Um, high operating cost for lead acid, that's a disadvantage. Lithium ion is lower operating cost. 
Um, sodium sulfur flow battery, again, the cost, all, the, all these questions that a person wants to ask. Now we're about the number of cycles. These cycles are uh, relatively consistent with what we've uh, observed uh, lithium ion, uh, slightly different from different, different folks. This is out of the uh, Interstate Renewable Energy Commission. Uh, summary, which was much more recent than the 2012 summary that came out of uh, uh, National Renewable Energy Labs. The, this is about where we are right now with uh, currently available storage. Okay, so again, some very useful numbers to uh, have available when uh, for, for a dinner time conversation. Uh, you probably have somebody, a woman sitting across from you is going to say, uh, if you had your choice, would you invest in flow batteries or flywheels? And you get a chance to talk about all these different properties and how they compare for flow batteries and flywheels. And what an interesting dinner time conversation that might be. So uh, again, I hope this will help some people to uh, uh, integrate into the, the, the mainstream dinner conversation that so many of us engineers have had difficulty doing over the years. Um, <clears throat> okay, molten salt energy storage technology. Excellent. Ivan, thank you for mentioning that. Um, and another, uh, I, I think it's very promising. And, and here's the thing, uh, it, it, you do it right on site. You use these huge uh, solar mirror fields and you heat up this salt to extremely high temperature, the solar power tower thing, like out in the uh, Mojave Desert. You, you, you kind of have to do these where you've got a lot of direct sunlight because uh, when you've got diffuse light, when it's cloudy, these things don't work very well. But when you've got direct sunlight, they can be focused. These are great. So desert, uh, in, in, in any high desert area is fantastic. And uh, uh, I think we're really gonna see a lot of this happening uh, they're becoming cost effective. You heat them to about 800 degrees C, uh, pump them down underground for storage and boil water at night when you need electricity. <coughs> and uh, uh, so, so this is a type of solar that in fact is um, much more predictable than the typical solar that requires battery storage. So Ivan, thank you for thinking that great question. Um, so, okay, let's see, some of our storage characteristics, uh, we're ready to move to the next one. How do you assign value? How many, uh, I've got this battery that I put in my car that I used to drive around when I plug it in and I'm willing to sell some back to the utility. How do I assign value? Well, again, if we look at the levelized cost of energy, it doesn't quite do it either. How much do we have to charge per kilowatt hour to pay for the batteries? That's basically, but, but, but where, where does this come? Well, one thing you can do is your energy time shifting and there's a lot of value in that um, because after all the peak energy uh, use is generally four or five in the afternoon and the peak energy creation by the sun is more between 10 and two on, 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 on solar time. So time shifting is really important. Eliminating peak demand is, 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 is a real value in that. Uh, folks up in Vermont especially are taking advantage of that. <clears throat> um, more reliable network, there's this value in that. Um, re 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 reducing congestion on the grid. Um, local generation as opposed to having to send it all in by way of transmission line. Uh, there has to be some value to that. And then the ancillary services that uh, the dispatching of this energy and so forth uh, uh, has to be some value there too. People are gonna have work jobs doing that. So all of these are things that we should be able to add to our cost per kilowatt hour if we wanna sell the electricity that we save. So again, this is out of IRAC and these people are really bright people, very future forward looking. And uh, <clears throat> so, so as far as energy storage is concerned, if you're going to build it, if you're an investor, you got to figure out where is your money going to come from. And these are the sources of uh, return on investment. Um, so here's what IRAC, uh, oh, it's council, Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Okay, good. 
glad I finally wrote that down. Um, the foundational actions to advance energy storage. Here's what we need to do is forget about the technology. What do we need to do with the government and other <clears throat> financial markets? Well, uh, we have to clarify how they're classified. Okay, <laughs> are they generation? No, not really, they're storage. And uh, so, so, so we need to figure out what it's, uh, how, how do we pay for, how do we collect money from storage? Need some, uh, you know, public utility commission rulings on this. Um, proactive consideration of energy storage and utility planning efforts. I can tell you that's certainly happening uh, down in my neighborhood and I'm sure it's happening in yours as well. <clears throat> because utilities are noticing that by using storage, they can save thousands and thousands of dollars in peak load in, in demand management. Uh, fair streamlined cost-effective grid access. Uh, you know, there's some cases where uh, you don't want to sell your electricity from your batteries to the grid because they don't pay you a fair price for it. So if they want to have your battery electricity going to the grid, then you better be remunerated for it. And that should count. Like, for example, if you open up your batteries at three o'clock in the afternoon, even if your battery energy doesn't go into the grid, you're still reducing the load on the grid by that amount of energy that you use internally that the utility doesn't have to provide to you, they can provide it to somebody else. <clears throat> it's important stuff. And uh, so, so, so we need to figure out how do we capture the full value of the stream of storage services, which is what we just looked at. <clears throat> so it's 12.02 and uh, we supposed to be done at 12.01, but we're close. <clears throat> Here's a microgrid. It's basically like a house, except it's a neighborhood. It's got a big control center there and they've got lots of loads. There's some gas turbine generation, there's some wind generation, there's some solar generation, maybe fuel cells, energy storage, diesel generators, lots of generation. And all the energy management center has to do is decide which of those sources to use, whether to buy some from the grid or to use it for the local stuff or sell some of the local stuff to the grid. Same questions we've been asking about smaller systems. Now we can consider having a separate entity and this could be a military base. Uh, these are microgrids are really being thought of um, and, and they've been working on them in uh, down in the islands. Uh, where they've got a lot of diesel generation. Uh, credit for this drawing goes to a former PhD student of mine who in 27 went to work for 2017, defended her dissertation and went to work for Next Era Energy. So this is what you want to do with the microgrid. And that's a little bit different from the microgrid that you see in the National Electrical Code. National Electrical Code defines electrical microgrid ever so slightly differently in terms of a grid within an occupancy. So anyway, um, there's the bell. Uh, we're done. And uh, there's some pumped hydro. And uh, there's one of those big megawatt. Uh, I bet you can guess what that is. Nice and round like that. What do you suppose goes round and round and round like a flywheel? Okay, that's uh, one of those big flywheels. And, and here's, um, uh, you know, I look at these things and I think this one is lithium batteries. And I think this is flow batteries. And that's because if a flow battery leaks, you're going to want to walk on the floor. So they have this raised floor around it. And there's some of your big sources. And uh, appreciate you all joining us today. I hope you got uh, not only your time's worth, but also your money's worth. And uh, look in the chat for what to do next in terms of getting your certificate and getting copies of the slides. Uh, I'm going to say uh, we're, we're done here now. And uh, we're, we're, we're not screen sharing anymore. But I'm looking to see if anybody has any more questions. We can spend a little bit of time discussing if uh, you have any other comments or questions you want to deal with. 
If not, uh, you'll see somewhere in the lower right hand corner of your screen, the red button to press to exit the program. And uh, I see we still have 24 participants online here. Uh, Twenty-three, twenty-two, twenty-one. 22, 21. I like to uh, just sort of hang on until make sure that if anybody thinks of any last minute question. Of course, if you have a last minute question that you still want an answer to, send an email to PDH source. He will forward it to me. And if I have an answer or a reference or whatever, I'm happy to share. Looks like people are getting hungry. <clears throat> hmm. We still have nine participants, I think, who are looking for the red leave button. Just click that button. Oh, there's a Q&A popped up. Let me see what we got here. Okay, Julius has a 48 volt, 1200 watt solar panel installed with 20 kilowatt hour capacity and AGMs will replace with lithium iron phosphate. That's a lot of capacity with, um, with, 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 with AGM. Uh, you got big batteries, you must be the 400 uh, uh, amp hour. <clears throat> and, and, and a lot of them to the typical uh, battery is only a one kilowatt hour battery and use eight of those so you're using a two and a half and you're probably using eight of those okay glad you're uh okay four banks of 100 amp hour 48 okay yeah and then uh that is, is that an off grid application, Julius, or uh, or is it just storage? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure where you're, you're um, taking the course from, whether you're up in the Northeast where you like to have a little uh, storage after an ice storm or whatever, but that is a pretty substantial, uh, yeah, local ozone link, sure. Uh, but you want lights and you want heat if you're up North when you lose power in the winter. In 20 kilowatt hours, I'd do the job for that if you got gas heat. You gotta have the motor running on the fan or the igniter, whatever. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, Hisham up at uh, PDH is probably getting hungry. So let's let's call it the day for now. And uh, but feel feel free if you want to question, send it off to uh, PDH. He's be happy to forward it to me. And thanks for being with us. For those of you who haven't signed out yet, I'm going to close my questions. And uh, we've still got uh, two to five attendees. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe. Wear those masks. Whatever. I'm not allowed to preach that. That is not a political statement. That is a scientific statement. Wear that mask. Okay, great. Bye everybody. <laughs>